It gives me great honor at this opening day and opening session to introduce to you Prime Minister Abe, Prime Minister of Japan. And Prime Minister, when we met some months ago, you promised to come to Davos. And I know you are a man who keeps his promises. You mentioned to me there's only one difficulty. It's the opening of the diet, which usually takes place end of January. So what we did, we are slowly advancing the beginning of the annual meeting to make sure that you, cannot, that you can be with us not only today, but also in the coming years. And so there is no conflict anymore. Now, when we met via video at the last annual meeting in a small group, and you asked to bring together some of the world's best economists to have a dialogue with you. You were just at the beginning of Abenomics. You shot the first and the second arrow. Now, I can say Japan is back. And we are very eager to listen to you about the third arrow, which uh, certainly you will develop for us. But I would also like to use this opportunity to congratulate you, because in the last 12 months, you also were awarded the site of the Olympic Games in 2020. Prime Minister, when we talk about Abenomics, it's not just your country which is concerned. We know that we are living in an era where the traditional economic concepts may be not valid anymore. And please, all the economists in the room, excuse me if I say so. We need new, bold concepts. And Abenomics is such a bold concept, which may be valid for quite a number of countries in the future. So what you are telling us now is very crucial for all of us. Please join me here on the stage, Prime Minister. Thank you, Professor Schwab, for your kind introduction. Uh, Mr. President, it's an honor to speak after you. Now, I don't know who chose it, who coined it, but they call my economic policy Abenomics. Well, I hesitate to go on calling my own name, but let me use it anyway. So, Abenomics has three arrows. The first is a bold monetary policy. The second is about flexible, flexible fiscal policy. And the third arrow will continue sparking private investment. Japan economy is just about to break free from chronic deflation. This spring, Wages will increase. Higher wages, long overdue, will lead to greater consumption. Our fiscal situation has also made steady improvement. Japan is now getting on track for fiscal consolidation. Pandits used to say that Japan was at dusk or the land of the setting sun. They said that for a country as mature as Japan, growth would be impossible. These arguments were made to sound almost legitimate. 
you can see what Japan's psyche was like before I took office as Prime Minister. Hardly can you hear any such voices now. Our growth rate has changed dramatically from negative growth to positive. In six years' time, the Olympics and the Paralympics will come to Tokyo. People are now more vibrant and upbeat. It is not twilight, but a new dawn that is breaking over Japan. May I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that late last year, we decided to go on major reforms. I have broken through the notion that certain reforms could never be carried out. We will completely liberalize Japan's electricity market by the time the Olympians compete in Tokyo in 2020, Japan's electricity market will also be completely competitive for both power generation and retail with power generation split off from power transmission. In Japan, people have long said that such a thing is just impossible. We will also foster medical care as an industry. Japan is on the leading edge in regenerative medicine. We will make it possible to generate cells at private sector factories. In Japan, people have long said that such a thing is just impossible. We are also doing away with the rice production adjustment system. This system has been in place for more than 40 years. Private companies will be able to engage in farming without barriers and grow the crops they want without artificial control over supply and demand. In Japan, people have long said that such a thing is just impossible. And yet, last autumn, we actually decided to make all these changes. In addition, yesterday morning, I gave additional instructions to reform the Japanese system because we also need large-scale healthcare companies in the, in the form of holding companies, much like the Mayo Clinic. I have maintained that I'm willing to act like a drill bit, strong enough to break through the solid rock of vested interests. Soon, our deregulation packets will be set in motion. Designated areas on my own watch will cut through red tape. There, over the next two years, no vested interest will remain immune from my drill. In cities, hoping to join the world-class limits on floor area ratios will become a thing of the past. The sky will be the limit. We will soon see high quality housing or business complexes and zero emissions towns appearing one after another. The Trans-Pacific 
partnership over TPP will remain a central pillar of my economic policies. We will push ahead the Japan-EU Economic Partnership Agreement. Those will surely make Japan's economy even more deeply integrated into global flows of knowledge, trade, and investment. Companies and people from abroad will find Japan among the most business-friendly places in the world. Japan's public fund management will also change a great deal. Japan's government pension investment fund now holds about 1.2 trillion US dollars. We will press ahead with forward-looking reforms, including a review of its portfolio. The GPIF will contribute to investment leading to growth. We must also make the tax system for companies international competitive, internationally competitive. We will reduce the corporate tax rate by 2.4% from April this year. We will also encourage companies to use the cash they have gathered towards capital investment, R&D, and raises in workers' salaries. To do this, we'll put tax incentives into place in a way completely different from before. This year, we will set about further reform on corporate tax. We will reform the labor market that ties workers to old industries. New industries require innovative and creative human resources. We will redirect our subsidies so that workers without meaningful, meaningful work in old industries can move to new industries that require good human resources. Japan is becoming a super aging society, even as the number of children is falling. You might find yourself asking, in such a country, where will you find those innovative and creative human resources? Ariana Huffington once said that if Lehman Brothers had been Lehman Brothers and sisters, the farm would have survived. <laughs> Japan's corporate culture is still one of pinstripes and button downs. After all, the female labor force in Japan is the most underutilized resource. Japan must become a place where women shine. By 2020, we will make 30% of leading positions to be occupied by women. In order to have a large number of women become leading players in the market, we will need a diverse working environment. Support from foreign workers will also be needed for help with the housework, housework care for the elderly and the like. Japan's GDP could grow by 16% more if women participated 
in labor as much as men. That is what Hillary Clinton told me. I was greatly encouraged. Another thing that will be needed is a major impetus for change aimed at corporate boards. We will soon put forward changes in the corporate law to the upcoming parliamentary session. Under these changes, external, external directors will increase. Next month, we will also draw up a stewardship code. It will make it easier for institutional investors to have a greater role in corporate governance. All of these combined, I'm sure we can double our inward direct investment by 2020. All this would reboot the entire country. Japan's economic landscape will change dramatically. On March 11, 2011, the northeastern part of Japan was hit by the triple disaster of the earthquake, tsunami, and the nuclear power plant failure. Three years will soon have passed. The love and compassion we were given from the world touched us deeply. The recovery is far from over. I'm the one most responsible for the future of the survivor, survivors. Yet, it are these very survivors who helped each other with stiff upper lips, trying to overcome so many hardship. Their spirit of perseverance moved people all over the world. It is with that same spirit of mutual assistance that Japan is now set to turn into a nation that will contribute even more positively toward world peace. In Cambodia, the hospital Japan built for mothers and newborn babies helped reduce the country's infant mortality rate. In the Philippines, after a devastating typhoon, the relief effort by Japan's self-defense forces was movingly welcomed. Based in Dibuchi, over servicemen and women are still on high alert against piracy, protecting ships from around the world. In our age, no single nation can preserve peace by itself. None of us alone can solve the challenges the world faces without helping each other. A new Japan is now waving a banner for proactive contribution to peace. I want you to know you can count on us. Asia has become a growth center for the world. Japan is surrounded by neighbors with unlimited possibilities, such as China, South Korea, the Asian nations, India, and Russia. And across the Pacific, the TPP partner countries. In this region, which will be 
the engine driving the world economy forward. I am always contemplating just how we can achieve peace and prosperity and make them everlasting. The foundation for prosperity comes down to freedom of movement for people and goods. On the sea lanes, in airspace, and recently in outer space and cyberspace, freedom of movement must remain secure. The only way to fully keep these indispensable public goods safe and peaceful is to rigorously maintain the rule of law. It is for that purpose that fundamental values like freedom, human rights, and democracy must be assured. There is no alternative. If peace and stability were shaken in Asia, the knock-on effect for the entire world would be enormous. The dividend of growth in Asia must not be wasted on military expansion. We must use it to invest in innovation and human capital, which will further boost growth in the region. Trust, not tension, is crucial for peace and prosperity in Asia and in the rest of the world. This can only be achieved through dialogue and the rule of law and not through force or coercion. Now, in order to turn Asia into a region for trust and order and not one force and coercion, I would like, in conclusion, to make an appeal to Asia and the world. We must, ladies and gentlemen, restrain military expansion in Asia, which could otherwise go unchecked. Military budget should be made completely transparent and there should be public disclosure in a form that can be verified. We should create a mechanism for crisis management, as well as a communication channel between our armed forces. We must lay down rules that promote actions based on the international law of the sea. Only then, I believe, can we achieve growth and prosperity in Asia, where all of us can realize our great potential. Japan has sworn an oath never again to wage a war. We have never stopped and will continue to be wishing for the world to be at peace. It is my fervent hope that through abenomics, we can create a vibrant Japan that can bring about peace and prosperity in the region and in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prime Minister Abe. It was quite a comprehensive program which you 
presented us in order to regain momentum in the Japanese economy and particularly your very concrete reform proposals I think are very promising. Now, Prime Minister, allow me maybe a very touchy question. Um, you emphasized at the end the need for stability and peace and trust in the region. With your shrine visit, it looks to the world as that Japan's regional relations with neighboring countries, particularly China and South Korea, is getting worse. Can I ask you to elaborate maybe for us um, how in this, uh, let's say, very tenuous uh, situation um, you see the future? Much for a very straightforward question. Now, I believe that there is a major misunderstanding concerning the Yasukuni Shrine, so allow me to briefly explain to you what kind of place Yasukuni Shrine is. This year marks the centennial anniversary of the end of the First World War, and 50 years before that, there was this Meiji Revolution, and including the war debt of the Meiji Revolution and the war debt in the First and the Second World War, the spirit of those perished in these wars are enshrined in the Yasukuni Shrine. So I uh, paid respect uh, to those people who had perished in war for the nation, and I had prayed for the souls of the departed, which I believe is something quite natural for a leader of any country in the world. Now, in in Yasukuni, there is this remembrance memorial uh, in which all the war dead throughout the world are enshrined, not just limited to the people in Japan. And I have sworn an oath never again to fight war so that nobody would suffer from the sufferings or nobody would suffer from the devastation of the war. I believe many leaders in Japan uh, have the same feeling. Uh, I have no intention whatsoever to hurt the feelings of uh, people in China and also in Korea. And we believe that Korea and China are very important neighbors, and Korea uh, shares the same value system, and they are a free democratic country. And since we have these challenges, I believe it is very critical to have this uh, summit meeting. The door to dialogue is always open on our side, and we would like to, with great sincerity and with due courtesy, try to continue continue the dialogue. Just following up what you said, I, I think um, it was very appreciated and in the best uh, Davos spirit when you were sitting in the sessions this morning of um, President um, uh, Madame Park uh, listening to her. Now, if I take, a, if I go back to Abenomics, um, you have a, one of the highest debt ratios in the world, and you have an aging society, and at the moment, particularly with your first arrows, you are adding to your fiscal deficit. Now, what, what is the end game? Uh, could you just enlighten us how at the end? Uh, I, I expressed once you are running, and we are all running in the world, or trying to, to, to run our economies with a big uh, backpack on, on our shoulders, the debts. Now, is the backpack so big that one day you will break down, or can you get rid of the back, uh, backpack, or at least um, get some weight out of it? 
Indeed, as you said, Professor Schwab, uh, Japan has uh, various uh, difficult challenges uh, that it is uh, faced with. On the debt issue, for fiscal consolidation, first of all, we should reduce uh, and do away with waste. At the same time, we have to increase tax uh, revenue. Uh, there's no other alternative. There's no other way. Japan has experienced prolonged deflation, and uh, tax revenue has uh, continued to diminish uh, um, uh, Nominal GDP has gone down, so it's natural uh, that we see this. So we have to end the deflation to grow the economy and increase tax revenue, and at the same time, uh, eliminate waste. This is the policy I have introduced, and uh, this is indeed uh, the policy of the three arrows. Fortunately, at one time, tax revenue, which has dropped to 38 trillion yen uh, this year, uh, will uh, increase or has increased this fiscal year to 50 trillion yen. And uh, furthermore, in April, we'll be uh, hiking the consumption uh, tax uh, from 5% to 8%. In uh, reducing uh, the debt, uh, we have to turn the primary balance uh, into a surplus. The primary balance uh, deficit is still very large compared to the GDP uh, in uh, compared to uh, 2010. Uh, by uh, two 2015, we want to reduce the deficit of the primary balance uh, to one half, and uh, achieving this goal is in the horizon. Uh, we uh, have uh, made no waste, uh, and uh, we will grow the economy, and uh, we will move ahead with uh, structural reform to grow the economy, and uh, we will uh, increase uh, tax revenue and uh, to consolidate uh, our finances, uh, fiscal situation. Prime Minister, Abe, when, when we met um, last time, we, of course, I congratulated you for the Olympic Games, and we discussed the possibility of conducting in the Japan a Davos for the sports to bring together the best minds of uh, and the best spirits and the best people in the sports and uh, community. Um, and to hold uh, this Davos for the Sports in 2017, what are, what are your expectations concerning such an event? To prepare the Olympics. The 2020 uh, Tokyo Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games uh, will see athletes uh, from all over the world uh, come to Japan. And we want to create a situation where they can do their best and where they can give their best. And at the same time, uh, we want to extend uh, hospitality or omotenashi, leveraging on Japanese uh, tradition and culture. We want to make these games uh, one which will make its mark in history. Uh, toward uh, 2020, uh, we hope that Japan uh, will regain uh, vitality uh, so that uh, uh, we want to uh, repay those uh, who have uh, supported us uh, after the disaster uh, by showing uh, how we have recovered. And the sports tomorrow, a sports for tomorrow, is something uh, that uh, we have uh, committed to. Uh, this is our uh, contribution to sports. Uh, uh, a target is over 10 million people. Uh, we will be uh, sending sports instructors, uh, instructors overseas. Uh, this is a plan uh, which is in the making. And uh, for uh, we want to provide the support uh, for putting in place the environment conducive to sports. And uh, your proposal uh, on uh, sports uh, for tomorrow Oh, and the Sports uh, Culture Davos uh, Conference. I'd like to uh, definitely uh, extend my cooperation to hold this conference, 2017, uh, the Sports Davos, uh, so that this is successful. I'd like to render my fullest cooperation. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. We are at the end of our session, and I only can tell you all our best wishes accompany you when you are going back now to announce some of those um, reforms also to, to push them through the diet and to make them successful. 
and we are sure with your personality, with your strengths, we will have a new Japan being born under your leadership. Thank you very much, Prime Minister.